Um, good day, everyone, and welcome to today's seminar. Um, a fortnight ago, we hosted Professor Saeed al who uh, made a case for the relevance of Max Weber's um, methods in sociology to contemporary, contemporary studies of society and politics in the Middle East. Um, Weber was a multi-causalist in understanding social power and the social order. Um, he paid attention to ideology, which includes religion, um, class, and the state. His multi-causality, however, um, is not necessarily but balanced. Um, politics and the state are given a considerable level of primacy in his analysis. Um, what we will hear today is almost a counterpoint to Weber, um, perhaps not explicitly, but implied in our guest speaker's focus on economic modes of production, a counterpoint which, similar to the Marxist tradition, stands against the proposition that the bureaucratic or legal rational modern state has gained primacy, uh, specifically when it comes to defining <coughs> social relations. Um, so today's seminar focuses on the interactions of socio-economic and sectarian factors that um, contributed to the disintegration of modern state institutions in Syria. Um, we started debating these themes during the last seminar, and we will continue discussing them today with our guest speaker, Dr. Sham al -Azmi. Dr. Azmi is assistant professor at the University of Ba. He is a professional economist with more than 10 years of experience in research, teaching, and policy on issues related to international political economy, international trade, global production networks, and industrial policy with a focus on the Middle East and North Africa. So we're in for the tree. So, Dr. Shaman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so thanks, Harut. Uh, first, I'm really glad to be here for the opportunity to speak, and then hopefully, hopefully, so I thank the project and Dr. Aziz too for, for the invitation and Christian for organizing it. Um, what, I, what I'm going to try and do is, is, is to kind of try to provide a, a political economy perspective <coughs> into partially the roots of, 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 of focusing on the Syrian crisis, but at the same time, I think it will be interesting to think about it more as a, as a state evolution in the Middle East more broadly. So a lot of these trends we see in other countries in the region too. Uh, my focus will be on the Syrian case. We can see similarities and differences across the region, but from, and there's growing work looking into this. So the idea that how do we see uh, political economy evolution of state institutions shaping the disintegration of states that, that we started seeing maybe more than the last few years it actually started before that. But but we've seen it in a more clear way in the last few years. And probably Syria is the most extreme case in terms of collapse of state institutions, essentially. Um, so so um, th I, I, through that, I'll go through... Uh, there's a lot of material I'm trying to cover, so I'll try and weave in a bit between the empirical and theoretical side. I'm not going to divide it into two separate sides, let's say. Uh, but I'm happy to discuss more at the end if there's any specific points to talk. Uh, I'm drawing a bit on this paper here, which was <coughs> published in Politics and Society uh, uh, last year, which kind of basically presents the main <coughs> argument I'm, I'm, I'm talking about here, which is, I'll, I'll try and explain a bit this idea of the development of rentier fix and, and the way kind of the end of that, that fix in the Syrian case led, and the political economy conflict that that triggered led to, to kind of around the new elite rule in the country. Uh, in terms of drawing on, 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 on terms of sources and methods, um, so I'm drawing a lot of research I've done in the last few years on this case, but I'm also drawing on work in Syria in the period which I think is kind of crucial for this, which is the 2000s, especially 2005, 2010. At the time, I was working at, as an economic assistant at the European Commission delegation in Damascus and a part-time journalist in an economics newspaper. So I was kind of very involved in sort of these debates of what economic policies are, are being, you know, and different kind of drivers for these economic policies. So I'm kind of also reflecting on that experience, bringing some of that into, into this country. So, so the first thing is, is which is, I'm sure more people are, are who, who work more from this perspective would know more than I do about these. But, but a lot of them, the, when if somebody is looking at this from a economic or polit political economy perspective, um, you see these arguments around the, the reason for the Syrian conflict. Let's say, you know, why do we see, why do we see what we're seeing in the last few years? And there's this heavy focus on on issues around, you know, you have the arguments around the religious hatred or kind of ancient historical conflicts in the region. There's a big, which you see a lot in the media too, and by many academics, around these kind of artificial colonial borders in the region, the argument that the Middle East was drawn to fit the, the borders that Britain and France at the time agreed on. It doesn't really really fit the ethnic or the religious kind of, kind of makeup of the region, which leads to what we're seeing today is some sort of correction of that historical mistake in, in, in a way. And I think a lot of you see a lot of academics making kind of that argument. There's the, this quote I'm kind of like used to reflect this argument, which is uh, 
this idea of great sorting out by Joshua Landers, who works on Syria, his argument is we were witnessing the rearrangement of population to better fit the nation state. So the nation state was created by France, Britain, uh, it didn't fit the ethnic, religious, you know, makeup, and now we're correcting that through what we're seeing in the region. And, you know, that's just because he's, you know, relatively one of the famous people working on Syria, but you see similar kind of, kind of stories around these lines in, 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 in a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, literature on, on, on the Middle East. And it's, it's in no way it's kind of unique to the Middle East because uh, if you look at theoretically around these arguments, you see, especially if you look at, at a lot of the African political economy literature, um, you have hu- very similar kind of arguments. Every time there's a conflict, there's this argument around how the borders were kind of fixed uh, and the problems that that created. So the problems with this kind of, from my perspective at least, I'm sure, some people would know more from around these things, but from my perspective, I find this argument a bit a bit historical in a way. So it's an argument that sees history in a way in a fixed way that there is nothing you know. You create this hundred years down the road, there's no change. You know, at the end, borders or societies are all made up in different ways. And the idea that that what we see is these kind of fixed identity argument that we see around this uh, is to me is very very problematic because at the end of the day. Uh, all borders, like, you know, the arguments around Africa, for instance, you see that all borders are artificial. All borders, are, all identities are artificial. Uh, so, so it doesn't also explain a number of things to me from a more research perspective. It doesn't really explain, you know, how they, these countries did exist for, you know, a few decades, for instance, with without these things boiling. Why suddenly these things emerged as, as a big factor? It seems like an argument that you could use at any point to explain anything before that, because you could at any moment in time say this happened because that was the root cause. So, so in a way, it doesn't really, to me, capture, capture more a dynamic way of, of how states evolve and how these factors play into. I'm not denying that a lot of these factors could be important, but kind of placing them outside any discussion of state institutions, of, of political economy, of states, seem to be a bit of an easy easy argument in a lot of cases. Um, and, and they see religious sectarian identities are kind of separate from these socioeconomic factors in a lot of cases. When you separate the two, you're seeing you're either on this side or on that side. A lot of, a lot of cases you see this, this kind of interaction between sectarian or religion identity issues and between socioeconomic values, which is something which I'll try to reflect on at the end. Uh, empirically, also, it's a bit of a questionable argument because we have a lot of... Um, uh, debates around what happened post-independence in a lot of these states. Uh, to what extent it captures this kind of argument is, to me, a bit problematic. There was this this kind of point made about the impact of the Iraq War, that maybe the Iraq War led to kind of re-emergence of a lot of these issues. Uh, that was a big argument in the case of Syria, that a lot of these factors existed, but they were kind of... And then Iraq War kind of led to them growing. But, you know, that's something we could debate, I guess. I always feel that that's line is probably there, but there is a big kind of kind of emphasis of, 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 of how this led to this kind of complete collapse of, of, of identity. Um, it also, to me, fails to capture the regional moment, essentially, because uh, what happened in Syria in 2011 was more related to what happened in Tunisia and Egypt than what happened in Iraq before, probably. And, and, and the Tunisian Egypt story is not, doesn't really have a lot of these dynamics in there. And it was clear for for in the region at the time, it was clear that this this is the kind of the same same dynamic process that started there. And clearly, I was in Damascus at the time, and Egypt was the huge influence where everybody was watching and everybody was following that. <clears throat> so, so I think I'm, what I'm going to try and say basically is 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 that I'm going to try and place some of these factors within a bit of a social economic and political economy perspective. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to go back a bit to some of the earlier history of state institutions in Syria and try to kind of map out very, very quickly how we reach that point from this perspective. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people know, but after, after, after independence in uh, Syria in the 40s, um, so the country moved into a number of different political systems. We started with what you could say a nominally democratic system, you had a parliamentary system. Uh, in reality, it did reflect a very strong uh, dominance of the elite at the time, who through different ways maintained control over the political processes. So you have you know, the elections of the 50s or the 40s, late 40s, uh, which is, you know, we, it, had, it had democratic institutions make up, but at the same time, uh, if you look at urban elite, they had huge dominance, but especially in the rural areas where 
uh, landlords were kind of the feudal system dominated and where you had this kind of ability to, to get voting in the right way in, in those places. So there's always a debate in, in Syria. A lot of people romanticize, I think, that period as being the kind of the democratic period. Sure, at, at some level, it, it did have more democratic elements at that level, but at the same time, economically, it was a period in which you had complete dominance of an established elite that existed from pre-independence period. So, so and, and that system was being challenged in different ways. Um, a lot of um, a lot of books or a lot of um, memoirs of politicians from the time reflect those debates in an interesting way. One of the books which I found really really interesting is uh, the memoirs of the, uh, Khaled Ladum, who was a prime minister at some point, and who talks from um, a, a step from an elite perspective, but from a reformer elite perspective sort of thing. So his perspective in the book is that is that you know if we don't sort of deal with this, this system is not going to. It's not going to stay in place. Uh, so we need to reform that system. But that was a voice within within the elite at the time. So so why a lot of people within that group at the time resisted any political economic change in the country. Um, and similar to a lot of that post-independence countries, the first issue that emerged was around redistribution. Around redistribution and about development. On one hand, you had countries that before were, were under colonial rule. Uh, those countries were, were at the time... People were like, you know, it's because of colonialism, there's poverty, there's all that. But at that point, you started, the new state needed to deliver. The new state needed to be able to, to fund education, to fund public services, to fund agriculture, to be able to kind of, kind of show that, that independence actually meant a boost in, in, in the economic and the standard of living in the country. So that, that was one, one side of it, sort of a developmental challenge, if you want. These states suddenly are thrown into state building missions, right? So state building at institutional level, state building at, at uh, social level, state building in the Middle East at the military level too, right? Because a lot of these countries suddenly became into the, the Arab-Israeli conflict, which kind of drove this huge, suddenly you need to build, you know, all these kind of institutions. So so you had that that element. And, and that developmental element was at the same time, the kind of the second part of it is a distributional question, is, you know, how do, who owns what in the economy? So in the sense of the old elites that, that have existed during colonial period were being challenged into different forms of redistribution, right? So, so issues around taxation started becoming big is, you know, how, what kind of taxation we're going to use, what kind of redistribution versus non-redistributive taxation system we're going to have. And the big issue is, again, there's, that's not a Syrian story, that's a story anywhere, is the number one issue was land reform at the time. So land ownership, who owns the land, was the top political issue, which is, again, you see in most newly independent countries. Uh, issues around industrialization, around the role of the state in the economy, with a lot of the new political movements calling for much heavier involvement of the state and trying to drive the economy. Um, and there are issues around you know, labor rights, for instance, unions, uh, issues around uh, the, 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 the reforms in the agriculture sector. But the big one, if you look at, you do analysis of that period, the big one was the land reform issue, where a lot of people were pushing for new policies to, to, to reform land. Um, and, and, and that led to kind of, kind of Syria at the at that point in time, again, similar to a lot of newly independent countries, being extremely unstable politically, politically, right? So the country passed through a huge number of changes, a huge number of from military coups to, to, to different changes in government, um, to the degree that I think I have this quote here from a paper in 1978 in which, you know, there's basically the argument that no other Middle Eastern country has been as unstable in the post-independence period than Syria, uh, it moved between all these kind of inter-Arab politics until military coup in 1949, and then moved into into to 1970, where you basically had um, the num the 21st 21 changes of government in 24 years, right? So you had a huge number of changes in in, in 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 a relatively short period of time, and that maybe you know you could debate to what extent that's the, but comparing to other Middle Eastern countries, that's more unstable or less, but you have a similar history in a lot of these countries. And a lot of it is driven by these conflicts, these kind of redistribution, development conflicts. Right? On one hand, uh, a lot of movements demanding changes to, to land reform, to agriculture, to industrialization, labor unions, and a lot of traditional parties that sort of represented the old 
the old elite were still kind of kind of dominant in those countries. So, um, and 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 one of the big things that we saw around this is the rise of these what you could call at the time. I mean, we could call them socialists, we could call them kind of anti-establishment parties, or you know, new parties that that challenge the dominance of the old elite. And again, that's something we've seen across across different places. So, uh, a lot of kind of socialist leaning, let's say, parties that mainly pushed for around these issues, right? So it was the idea that you go for issues around land reform, industrialization, state-owned sector, nationalization of enterprise, uh, labor union. And again, a lot of it was driven, there was a factor definitely of kind of Cold War impact there, but at the same time, uh, these parties appeal to 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 a lot of, a lot of um, especially in the kind of um, uh, the poor areas in these countries. Uh, in Syria, you have the kind of different mix. I'm not going to go into, into who they are. You probably all... Most of you would know who they are. We had the Arab nationalist kind of movement. We had the communist movement. Uh, we had, uh, you know, Arab nationalists divided into different groups. So they were influenced by Nasser and Egypt. Um, so within that mix, you do have a lot of different movements, a lot of conflict between them. But all of them sort of appeal to these kind of kind of changing economic economic um, uh, uh, kind of conditions. If you look at the old elites at the period, you see it was kind of split between a wing which kind of accepted the need to reform, to have some sort of changes in the political institution in the country, and between a wing which was more traditional in the sense of refusing any sort of changes to their economic or social power. And again, uh, again, like you know, one of the good uh, Khalid Lagum could be one of the good examples of that. Is 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 one of the kind of the reformers within the elite sort of sort of that wing at the time. Um, a lot of them were were kind of industrialists. There was new industrial sector also emerging. A lot of agriculture industrial sector that also saw benefits in some of these reforms because that would free up labor resources. That would provide a market for new products that they're producing, uh, which is, again, different interests from the land sector, from the agricultural sector, where you had more need to maintain the feudal system, essentially. So um, just kind of to put some faces into this. Um, I'm not, not sure if you, you kind of all know who those people are, but there's three of the kind of, the kind of interesting characters. Uh, this is Akram Sorani, who is one of the... Uh, Founders essentially of the Ba'ath Party through a different, different wing at the time, but he was basically campaigning on land reform issues, especially in the area around Hama. Uh, he kind of gathered a lot of following from that message. Uh, this is Khaled Ladum, who I just mentioned. He was kind of pushing for some changes from within within the government at the time, or from within the kind of the 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 the, the, the elite. At, and this is Khaled Bagdash, who was the first. Communist MP in the in the Arab world, I think, uh, and again was kind of became very influential during this period. So you have these kind of different different movements operating in, in, in that period. Um, but the question that a lot of these movements, especially the the socialist or more communist leaning movements, was, you know, how do you get to power essentially? Which is again a question that was faced in a lot of these similar new independent countries. You have these new political movements emerging. Uh, they didn't control the military initially. Uh, the political institutions to them were kind of rigged or controlled by the existing elite, so they found it very difficult to go down that route. So, so there is a division of how, how you sort of move from being able to mobilize and build some sort of wider social coalitions into ability to capture political power. Um, a lot of them, and you see that especially in the bad party arguments, you see a lot of them arguing that the, 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 the old elite dominance of the political institutions make going down the political route basically impossible. We're not going to be able to, to reach majority or power through the institutions because these institutions are, are already you know, controlled in different ways, which usually led to the military as, as, as a path, which was adopted in a lot of these countries. And again... Not, not exclu exclusively in the Middle East, you see it <laughs> elsewhere where you have a lot of attempt to capture kind of the military institutions as a way to get to get into power. And, and, and that was, the, again, the case in Syria where especially Ba'ath Party had a strong military wing uh, that kind of worked to, to, to expand its influence within the military and to build kind of, kind of a huge following to the degree that they became the most powerful group within the military and they were able to capture to capture power through through military coups, essentially, which you know, second with 1963, but 
again with 1970, as I'll talk in a minute when, when Assad came to power. So, so at that point, what we had is, is, is this um, rise of you know, these kind of parties, especially the Ba'ath Party, which became the dominant force with this, um, and trying to kind of, kind of mobilize on economic and also nationalist kind of message, issues around anti-colonialism or around the Arab-Israeli conflict kind of were key drivers of this too. One of the big factors in, in the case here is, is the, the rise of Nasser in Egypt, of course, which made huge boosts to a lot of these movements. The union between Syria and Egypt was, was a huge factor in this. A lot of political parties dissolved themselves, and also there was a huge constitutional changes that led basically to almost the complete disappearance of pre Union political institutions. So the big shift probably there was the shift from a parliamentary to a presidential system, which happened during the Union Constitution, when you had a complete shift from what was before a parliamentary system into a very, very centralized, controlled by the president, essentially, system. It's an extremely top-down kind of new, new constitution, which, which was adopted during that period. A lot of the old parties, which was one condition of Nasser, is dissolved themselves completely before the union. So a lot of these parties didn't exist. There was some sort of a, a new, almost a vacuum of political parties at that point. Um, so, so you had, the, during that period, which is only four years, you had the 1958 to 1962, the 63, the union with, uh, between Syria and Egypt. One thing was this big constitutional changes, which I think are very important. The discussion around the constitution in that period is really interesting between, you know, how, what kind of constitution, what kind of level of centralization, what kind of role for the parliament versus the president. And in a way, that set, I think, the path for post-union politics in Syria. Essentially, that complete shift that happened during that period. Um, there is, but on the economic front, friends, you had big changes too. So the biggest one was the land reform which happened in that period. So because of that very centralized system, uh, the, 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 the union period, and because of the popularity around, around uh, Nasser in that period, uh, they pushed through a strong new, uh, land reform policies in that period. We also had issues around nationalization of private enterprises, massive nationalization process taking place in that period. Um, and we had issues around um, state-owned sector expanding. So, so that was kind of the shift into a more state-led economy, generally speaking, I would say. Um, both kind of economic and also of the social system. Um, so, so with, I'm not gonna again. I'm trying very briefly to go through all these. Um, but what, end of the union again represented this kind of conflict again. On one hand, the kind of the old elite saw this an opportunity to kind of reclaim what was lost during the union. So, so we've seen this kind of debate around around the first parliament and government around around the land reform. Uh, initially, there was a push to reverse land reform. There was strong resistance to that. That led to a constitutional crisis at the time. Um, and again, you had this kind of big conflict between around these, these issues re-emerging, especially land reform. And that, you know, that a lot of different things happening at the time, but that essentially ended with the 1963 coup through which the Ba'ath Party captured power. So you moved into, after a year or so, of, of these kind of internal, internal uh, conflicts around around a lot of these economic issues. So, um, and then we have the seven years period, if you want, the 1963 to 1970, which is the rule of first Ba'ath Party, so pre-Assad Ba'ath Party, if you want. Um, and again, we continue to see these political economy, social, social economics conflicts here. There is one wing within the Ba'ath Party that wanted to go deeper into, into reforms of the economic system in terms of kind of reversing the, the position of the old elite even more. So, you know, a lot of policies that were seen as anti-urban, for instance, policies that people in the cities, small merchants or, you know, old kind of economic class, so as an attack on their position, that kind of continued. There was this wing within them more called the radical bath. Uh, at the same time, there was a wing which was more of an economic, economically moderate, let's say, wing, which which argued that, yes, now we capture power, we shouldn't try and push further against, you know, what, not sure to what extent you can consider that elite anymore, but even against the small kind of business sector, right, which was dominant in the big cities. Uh, you had a lot of strikes in that period in the cities reflecting that tension. And, and essentially what you had is, is the moderate wing, economically moderate wing, arguing that, that what we need to do is, is, is to kind of consolidate our position, maintain that we keep control of the state, uh, going too deep into challenging uh, 
different economic groups and different social economic groups is going to lead to you know destabilization again we're not going to be able to kind of consolidate our power and 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 that's what kind of kind of happened in the end essentially Assad represented on the economic front that kind of wing is the idea that okay we try and capture uh, or consolidate our political power, but at the same time we try and make peace with the small business kind of kind of kind of sector. Uh, we try and make kind of alliances with some of the old elite that accept, you know, do doing business with us essentially, rather than continue a bit of. And there was a regional element too. So the idea of the debate was also how we deal with the rest of the region, right? So there are some of the more radical Ba'ath figures wanted to kind of continue sort of sort of in the region by by trying to. To, to not topple, but trying to influence other countries into a similar direction with the idea that Ba'ath is this kind of all, all Arab kind of thing. While Assad wanted to kind of maintain okay relationships with, with the other countries. So, um, so that led to this kind of, kind of in 70 when he captured power, led to this sort of, um, sort of economically, at least socioeconomically, sort of a a degree of welcoming from from the cities at the time, from especially from the urban, what remains of the urban elite. A lot of the big businesses already left during the union; they don't exist anymore. But some of the small businesses or traders or you know small companies were kind of okay with this shift. That okay, we're now done with this kind of very radical period. We're going to have um, a bit of a more moderate economic. Uh, but that doesn't change the main problem that the state faced at the time, because the main problem the state faced was that the same conflict around 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 distribution and development. You still had to be able to you still had the demand for redistribution, and you still had the demand for investments in the growing parts. You know, you had growing population, you had growing needs socioeconomically. So, so there was this still pressure on the state in, in, in that period to do that. Um, the state-led economy, which started in the Union period, expanded, continued to expand under Assad. So Assad kind of continued this expansion of the state-led economy. He didn't try to reverse that in any way. But in, so, so you had a lot of investments in state-owned enterprises, a lot of, um, a lot of spending on infrastructure, energy, uh, a lot of food subsidies initially, a lot of these kind of policies that expanded the role of the state, leading to a very state-centric economic system. Um, in a way, that that kind of, uh, to a degree, mediated that developmental distributional conflict that exists in the country, in the sense that the ability of the state to deliver or to kind of, especially in the rural areas, especially in the poor areas, kind of reflected uh, or, or at least mediated these kind of economic, socioeconomic conflicts that existed. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is sort of how, how could it do that? So, so, you know, what was changed from the previous period to, to do that. Um, essentially, when from a political economy perspective, usually people would assess kind of the main channel of this redistribution is, is taxation policies, right? So, what kind of what is the taxation level in the economy? Who are you getting taxes from? And who are you spending taxes on? It's kind of the main measure that political economists would look to assess what is the state redistributing from and to. Um, and the problem before was around this, essentially, in addition to the other issues. So uh, if you look at the post-70s period, you see there was this delinking between these two dynamics, between who the state is taxing and who the state is spending. Uh, while this was before, sort of, always, like most countries in the world, kind of, kind of matched in terms of political conflict, the post-70s period um, ex witnessed sort of a delinking between the two. Suddenly, the state... Spending is, is 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 increasing massively, while at the same time the state extraction from the economy in terms of taxation was not increasing equally, and 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 that was sort of sort of a way of of of, of addressing this this problem that we've seen. Um, one of the things was which I'll kind of show you a few charts to kind of explain that a bit. Uh, one of the issues here that we see, which is the typical sort of frontier dynamic you hear about in the Middle East literature, is the role of oil. Uh, oil in Syria started um, exporting oil in the 1968 when they completed the pipeline from, from the northeast into the Mediterranean coast. So it became an oil exporter for the first time. That was a big factor in, in, in driving this. Um, there's also an issue, a boost in aid that we see post-70s, partially driven by this normalization of relationships between uh, the Syrian government and the Arab states, the Gulf states. During the radical bath period, the relations were quite bad. And then Assad came and said, no, you know, we want to have a good relationships, which kind of translated into a boost in aid. Uh, 
there's an issue of, of Cold War aid too coming into play here. Um, so, so, so if we, I'll, I'll, I'll have a few charts to explain that, but um, a lot of, lot of these new sources were starting to emerge in that period, post 70s. A lot of new funding, <laughs> state funding sources. Uh, oil and aid especially, but also a bit of debt from the Eastern Bloc at the same time started um, kind of kind of coming in. I'll, I'll just go through, through some of these. So, so this is oil rents as a percent of GDP. So think about it as you know how much oil essentially the country is, is exploring. And this is from the 70s. Well, that's the, okay, from the 70s basically you had this big, you know, it had, depends on oil prices, it goes up and down, but generally you started having Syria as an exporter of oil in, in that period. Before that, there was no oil rents in the economy. Uh, that was a big, a big factor in, 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 in this. Um, offshore development assistance, which is aid, basically. Again, this is 1960. You see it was almost zero in the 70s. Then there was this big boom in the early 70s. It declined after in the 80s and stayed down. Uh, again, a lot of that comes from the Gulf states, from uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the UAE, other countries, which which kind of spent more and more aid in Syria. Um, so what we're seeing in, in this field, if we look at, I'm not sure to what extent people are familiar with economic terms or not, but if we compare kind of the saving investments rate, so how much money is saved in the economy and how much money is invested, which usually the two kid link together, depends on if you have sort of other sources, right? And you see, you know, in this period, the 63 to 67 period, the two were, Relatively low, but at the same, but they were kind of similar. But then they, the gap started to widen between them. A lot of the state, a lot of investments here is state investments. So a lot of these these investments are, are done through state investments on a lot of uh, whether it's uh, you know infrastructure, industry, energy, uh, other other issues. Too. Um, so you started having this kind of kind of change in how how the state is funding that kind of new state expansion or new economic expansion. Um, again, debt is, is an interesting element here because, again, although 70s didn't increase massively, we see this is flow, so debt per year, how much you're getting. You see this period, again, the 80s, especially when oil prices went down, usually that was compensated by, by borrowing, especially on favorable terms from, from, the, from the Soviet Union or from other countries in, um, in the Eastern Bloc. Um, so you had, again, debt coming in as, as a factor of funding that kind of state expansion. Um, uh, at the same time, when you look at, at, at these dynamics, what you see is, is suddenly you have, if you think about states as, an, as a both kind of a, a, an extraction and distribution sort of machine, you could, you could try and see what, what was the Syrian state doing on both kind of sides of this. So on, one, on the extractive side, if we look at what state extracted from the Syrian economy, essentially, uh, from, I'm not sure when it started, but all throughout this period, the agricultural sector had complete exemptions or no taxes on agriculture, for instance. That was one of the benefits, let's say, that was provided to the agricultural sector is that there is no taxation. Uh, if you look at, and that applies all the way till 2010, Syria had very high taxation rates on paper. Uh, enforcement was, was extremely weak. There was a, you know, very, very little enforcement, whether that is for, uh, except for public workers or state-owned enterprises, or but like the private sector essentially had uh, very, very little ta effective taxation rates, although on paper it was very high. So And that applies to small businesses and to large businesses too, including the politically connected as large businesses, but a lot of the small businesses had a similar sort of very, very low taxation level. Um, so we have a lot of uh, tax evasion, um, a lot of the business sector, especially in the 90s, started expanding private investments. A lot of it had complete tax holidays. So there would be like seven years tax holiday, which they would renew after. So a lot of them paid almost no taxes at the period. Um, and if you look at, at, at the state-owned sector, so the surpluses coming from that could feed the state. Uh, initially, a lot of these enterprises were making money, but then by the 2090s, a lot of them were losing money, except the extractive industries, right? So if you exclude oil and minerals and these activities, you'd see very little kind of, kind of tax contribution to the economy. Uh, if you look on the other side, you see uh, of what the state, kind of the distributive role of the state in that period. So what was the state spending on, essentially? Um, so you see you, you know, at different points in time, uh, you see a lot of spending on, on, I mentioned these kind of infrastructure spending, but you also had a lot of spending on like social, 
economic progress, right? So you had a lot of subsidies on food products, for instance. Energy products were sold really cheap in the domestic market, subsidized usually. Uh, you had, you know, the debate, there's a debate on quality, of course, but you had free basic services, things like education or healthcare. Uh, you did have, although a lot of rural areas remained outside the reach of a lot of these services, but you do see a bit a big expansion in the delivery of these services to, to, to the rural areas too. Um, on employment, you had essentially what some people in the 2000s were calling social employment, which is essentially a lot of the state sector was employing way more than actually what, what they needed, but it was seen as sort of absorbing a growing population. So a lot of them were not, not doing much in terms of, of work, but at the same time, these jobs, low paid jobs, but you know, they still, still existed as a way of, of, of guaranteeing employment. And a lot of people, in the, when they were trying to do economic reforms in the 2000s, a lot of uh, consultants that I invited, they were like, well, you need to like, reduce the workforce in these businesses. But that was like, we can't do that because that's a very sensitive issue at the time. You know, it's seen more of a, of a, even these companies were making losses, but it's okay. The government would subsidize that kind of loss in return for, for, for these employment. You had in some cases these kind of guaranteed employment things for graduates of like engineering or medical schools or like you go, you automatically could get a state job basically if you do. You also had a huge spending on military and security of course, which is you know probably the biggest of all, right? So you had the huge formal spending to so a huge uh, military spending, but you also had this huge different security agencies which a lot of money was spent on in different formal and informal kind of structures, which again was one of the main, probably the main kind of kind of item the state was spending on. Um, and, and, and you had, you know, the, 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 the corruption element essentially, which is out of that you have a lot of money being kind of kind of taken away by different members and the kind of ruling, ruling elite at the period. Um, so, so if you look at kind of the distributive role, you, the state had a lot of these kind of kind of commitments to different social groups to keep essentially to keep everybody okay with the system, right? Nobody from people at, at uh, uh, people who are like traders who don't pay much taxes to farmers, for instance, who get subsidies to corrupt uh, military officers who get money on the side to, you know, all these different groups to the degree that they were okay with maintaining the status quo. There was no need to kind of challenge what, what, what was going on. Uh, the cost of the system too was going up because a lot of these items are sensitive to population. Right? So when you talk about education, about healthcare, about a lot of these issues, the bigger the population, the much more cost to maintain this. And, and one of the, the results of these policies is that you had the big boom in population too. So a lot of the, um, lot of the policies that usually could work as a check on population growth, economically speaking, you know, cost of uh, education, for instance, right? If it's too high, maybe that would affect the, or for instance, productivity of in the agricultural area or healthcare. A lot of these policies led to this big increase that we see with population increasing from, you know, around 5 million in the 60s to reach uh, more than 20 in, in 2010, leading to more and more kind of, kind of distributive commitments on, on, on the state, which were not really matched by extraction from the economy. So, so moving on from that, we get, um, just to give you some indicators here that you see of uh, basic kind of health developmental indicators. So things like life expectancy or like uh, mortality rates for uh, uh, for under five or immunization or primary completion rate, you did see during that period an improvement in, in these indicators, generally speaking, reflecting these kind of different socioeconomic systems that were in place. Um, so, so again, that was a big factor in driving not only uh, commitments of spending of the state, but also driving kind of population boom in, in, in that period. Um, so, so that system basically kind of lasted in place uh, until the 90s, where there was a big shock to the system. One of them was the, the end of the Cold War, which, which sort of limited the role of an external sort of guarantor of the system, that if, if things go bad, you have somebody to lend you favorable terms money. That was a big factor in the period. But at the same time, you also had shifting politics in the Middle East, you have the Middle East peace process coming in, which would have represented a big challenge to the entire system. Um, and, and in a way that left, if you look at aid and debt in that period, you see their role, which was kind of in the previous charts. So, you know, external debt uh, in the 90s, oh, 
This is not very easy. The, <laughs> the touch screen is... Uh, Okay, so that in this period you see a, a big decline. If you see at eight again in the 90s, it almost stopped existing. And that was sort of compensated by oil rents, by oil prices in that period. So the boom in oil prices in, in that period led to this economic pressure being not as bad as other could have been. Uh, but it was starting to become clear that there needs to be some sort of economic shift in the country, that this system that is in place is not going to be able to, to, to survive for long if, if there's no change in, in, in the fundamental. One way that at the time was considered was partially the, 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 the peace process because that was seen as a way to change the economic system essentially by, by more trade or investments from Western countries. But I guess the political cost of that was seen as too high to justify the, 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 the shift in that period. So, so essentially what you, when you entered the 2000s, you entered which is when Bashar came to power in 2000, uh, you entered the state that was economically, socioeconomically having extreme, growing, rapidly growing commitments, rapidly growing uh, spending, at the same time with declining ability to fund these, these things. Uh, the only thing, again, was left was essentially an oil, uh, which led to the fact that, that in reality, Syria is a tiny oil, oil producer. Right? Syria is not a major oil producer. It's a country that used a lot of oil in a specific short period of time to maintain some sort of a political economic system. But if you compare it to countries like you know, the actual big oil producer in the Middle East, uh, it's, it's not a, 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 a long-term producer that could actually build a stable political economy system on these kind of rentier, rentier model, essentially. So, so in, a way, in a way, you could think about it as the country becoming politically economic and socially economically almost an oil state in the sense of the very little taxation, high spending, uh, uh, very strong dominance of a small ruling elite with relatively controlled kind of opposition. At the same time, the difference is that Syria was not an oil state, essentially. You know, if you think long term, it was not an oil state. It was, it was a state that had some oil for a period of time. Um, so, so that led to, that was, and if you read a lot of comments, a lot of comments from people around the government in the early 2000s, this end of oil was becoming like a big theme. It really is like we need to like do change things because we're reaching the point where we can't sustain the system essentially. And if you look at you know take into account that with the population growth that we've seen, oil local oil consumption is increasing. Local oil consumption was at subsidized rates, so the state was actually spending more to actually sell the oil as a cheaper price. Uh, and, and with that declining production and increasing consumption, essentially the exports of oil were coming to an end. So that was, this is the production versus consumption of oil in Syria. And you can see consumption increasing steadily, um, um, oil production increasing this period. There was the 90s, there was new, oils, uh, new oil fields that were found. But then that declined start. It was expected that 2010, 2011 would be the point when Syria would become an oil importer, essentially. So the local cons production is not going to be able to meet domestic demand anymore, which financially interesting for the state. That means you need to import oil at international prices and sell it unless you change the prices domestically at a cheaper price. So oil would move from being the main funder of the state to being a cost, essentially, on the state. So, and that was a big, a big issue. Again, again, if you, I was at the time kind of not involved in these, but I was following these debates, and a lot of it was around the end of oil. Everybody really like, you know, what are we going to do when, 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 when oil, um, oil, oil turns um, One way to measure this is to see the budget deficit without oil for that, for, 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 for that period. And you could see that was 22 uh, out of GDP. That's a huge, huge budget deficit. If you look at, if you compare it to all countries, if you take oil out of the state, basically, that's 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 what you get. So you get that state could not neither deliver the main kind of social economic demands or can't afford to maintain this huge security military apparatus that the state built. It can't fund regional role, which was a big factor in maintaining internal stability, the ability to whether in Lebanon or in other places sort of export your role as a way of, of, of legitimacy in that home. Uh, so that state is a completely different player from, from the state that was built before. That's that kind of, especially Assad used to build his, um, his, his control of, 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 of politics. So, so from that period, and again, one, one more, I'm not going to give you too much, uh, too much uh, 
charts, I guess. But one way is to look at, at exports of the economy. So again, if you look at Syria, uh, Syria mineral fuel exports, that was the biggest group of oil exports. The country is essentially an oil exporter with very little anything else, very little agricultural exports or you know manufacturing exports. So again, it's an oil economy at least externally, right? Maybe internally you did have agricultural production and manufacturing for the domestic market, but then once you go to, you would need to import, to import you need to export, and that is a completely different picture where it's, it's an oil economy, essentially. Okay, uh, yeah, I still have one final one. Um, so so the, final, the final point I'm gonna make is, if, so this is, this is basically trying to plot two things. This is tax revenues. <coughs> as a percent of GDP. So how much a state is taxing the society or the economy, essentially? And that is oil as percentage of GDP. So how much oil the state? And if you look at the Middle Eastern countries, you see how you know this group of countries, the oil exporter mostly, so Kuwait, Oman, UAE, Bahrain, Iran. These are countries that have very low taxation. They almost don't tax the economy, or some of them have zero taxation policies, actually, and have a lot of, lot of oil, right? Uh, if you look at the non-oil exporters, so countries like Lebanon, Tunisia, Morocco, Jordan, Israel, Egypt, they tend to be in this group. So, so they relatively have higher taxation, but they have no oil, right? Um, uh, Syria, Qatar and Algeria is an interesting outlier. I could explain why they are a bit different. But Syria is the interesting case here is that Syria with, with oil is here. So in the sense that, that if you add oil... To, to the budget, the Syrian budget would be here. But if you exclude oil, essentially Syria would, would come here. So Syria was much more similar to, to, to the, the Gulf oil states than to the non-oil producers in the region in the terms of how much tax revenues were there. Because why would move? Because tax revenues in Syria partially are oil revenues. They are taxes on oil companies, essentially. So if you exclude those, you'd go, you'd go all the way here. And you see that you have suddenly a much more similar kind of kind of kind of balance to, to the oil producing countries in the region than to the non-oil producing countries in the region. And that again what was happening into kind of entering the, the that, that this is different points in 2000, so they don't have, because the data is not for every year, so, so it's different points for every country, but generally speaking, that's kind of the 2005, 2006 picture. So, so essentially, um, if there's any kind of clarification on any of these, I mean, no, I'm happy to talk now if there's any. Okay, so basically you're moving into what you could think of into an unsustainable economic model, basically. That was clear from the 2000s onwards, that you're entering a period that, as I said, you have an oil state political economic system almost with no oil that's not at that point, or running out of oil. Um, uh, and they started trying to adapt the system. You had a lot of, some attempts in the 90s, but the major push came in the 2000s. When they, 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 the government at the time said, you know, we need like massive economic reforms to deal with the end of oil, essentially, you know, and and that was the kind of the interesting, the interesting period. If you, to me, that was the big question of this 2000 2010 period is how, uh, or if you want the Bashar period in government is how would you adapt to this end of, of oil as as a system? So. Um, uh, so, so you, had, you have a number of ways to think about it. One way to think about it is, is a political shift, is a slow political transformation that would change the political economy of the country, but that would allow different socioeconomic political groups to be able to enter the political area. So essentially that would have meant a transition away from the dictatorship authoritarian model that existed and for the kind of the narrow elite at the time to accept a bit of a change, even if slow changes in the political system. And, and that was for a period that was kind of discussed initially in the 2000s a bit, but then they tried to move into this by essentially cutting this kind of distributive role of the state, right? So the state had essentially these two sides of the equation, if you want. One way could be for trying to increase taxation, especially taxation on, on the business class that was very close to the regime at the period. So, so the businesses that were essentially the same or their partners or their network, that was one way to deal with it. Or you could try and cut all these kind of commitments that maintained the, 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 the political stability before, right? which is more or less what they ended up trying to do. Right? So, so from two, especially 2005 onwards, uh, the state moved into trying to reduce all of the commitments that that they sort of sort of made before. So so you had things around changes, and first you have zero political changes essentially. If you think around 
things like how governments, you know, how top down centralized kind of the system is, you know, the issues like local elections or governments, governors of cities elections or all that remained completely controlled top down. There's no attempt to kind of change that, to try a bit more changing the system. But you had this idea of trying to have a bit of the, which was kind of a standard, what, what people, political economists tend to call new liberal kind of package of changes, of economic changes, which, which is the typical sort of like withdraw, you know, limiting the role of the state, trying to cut social spending, trying to encourage kind of private investors. That was kind of the 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 mix that I had and and um, you sort of, you started having things like for instance subsidies you started have this big attempt to reduce gradually reduce subsidies so things like food subsidies were being phased out in the two thousand five food prices were going up in that period uh, the big one was energy subsidies which was one of the huge issues because diesel subsidies were crucial for agriculture especially but also for transportation and and you know so so it was seen as a very sensitive because traditionally maintaining agriculture or rural areas stability was seen as a as an important objective of the regime so so the shift into into cutting diesel again or diesel subsidies which which, which took place in the second part of the 2000s was a big shift uh, things like you know healthcare and education were being kind of reduced or trying to shift into alternative models they had this kind of fee based system for education or trying to charge for for healthcare um, so, so all these policies were basically trying to kind of limit the cost of the system, the distributive role of the system. Um, and at the same time, uh, what we've seen is, is, is there is no effort at all to extract more s- contribution from the economic elite at the time. In fact, in fact, there was even less than before, probably. So a lot of new spaces were opened to, to a lot of businessmen who were very close to, to the governments, and they were, you know, part of the government, many of them. And essentially, you had a lot of these kind of new accumulation of of, of, of profits and capital going to those, you know, few few new members of, of, of the elite. Um, so essentially, what you started to have there is this kind of kind of shift into consolidation of this new economic elite power in the country, right? So you had this kind of a lot of it emerged was seen as more in the 80s or the 90s or before was seen as more you know either corruption or more of a you know illegal activities but now was being changed into kind of a kind of a legitimate business activities by by the same or you know second generation in many cases of of those people and 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 what we had basically is 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 um, on the external front is an attempt to kind of attract investments trying to focusing on the Gulf states at the time. So oil, again, they went to the Kuwait, Saudi, other countries, like opened up business opportunities, which there was a massive increase in investments in that period. But again, it didn't really match the needs of the economy because a country with a big young population at the period, a booming population, what you need is is things like labor-intensive manufacturing, for instance, things which absorb, create jobs. A lot of investments went into real estate, a lot of investments went into kind of tourism, uh, finance, uh, ta- um, financial services, banks. So you had a lot of big investments coming from the Gulf, mostly into kind of urban, um, uh, very low um, uh, labor-intensive activities. So it employed a relatively small number of people uh, in that period. And, and that reflected into kind of also a change into a much more um, uh, the new kind of kind of consolidation of, of the economic system into a much more kind of um, uh, consumerist kind of more capitalist system at the time. While the 90s, 80s was kind of a kind of more centrally controlled economy with little, you know, you don't really see a lot of wealth around. That started changing completely in 2000. A lot of money was coming in. A lot of uh, new kind of young professionals sort of generation was getting all these new jobs in banks or in services or in and suddenly you had like you know this huge uh, increase in urban consumerism in that period um, um so so basically the the what what some people have called like um this kind of earlier low trust coalition between the regime and between the business class uh, was being transformed into kind of a new consolidated elite rule economically speaking um just to give you kind of um um, that that at the same time, if you look at the, the economic, the trade position of the country, what you had, you had little change in actually 
how the economy is functioning. There is this, this is the non-oil exports of Syria. It increased after the Iraq war for a short period of time because Syrian companies export a lot of food and the medical products to Iraq after, after the war. But that started declining. Non-oil imports were increasing, partially fueling this kind of massive boom in consumerism. A lot of foreign products were coming in. And the state economic position, again, was, 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 was weakened. Uh, or being weakened into a very unsustainable kind of, kind of um, uh, international trade position. So essentially, essentially the attempt to reforms uh, of the economic system that existed basically uh, tried to limit the, the social cost of the system while trying to even maintain the same political, economic, and even consolidate that of a small number of, 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 of the elites, uh, kind of creating... I love the, if you look at things like unemployment, youth unemployment, for instance, or uh, living standards in the rural area, you'd see a massive decline in that period. So you'd see a lot of these places losing um, a lot of, uh, because of the, partially because of the subsidies. I just had like, I don't know if many people were, been there in that period, but you had like, you know, a lot of kind of new sort of projects like real estate investment, a lot of this is like Gulf, Gulf, uh, Gulf investments, these new plans to, to kind of rebuild cities and um, and a lot of you know, new sort of like restaurants and places kind of were opening up in that period. A lot of it again is maintained in the cities, including some kind of more you know cultural or art activities, resorts, and um, a gambling opened, which was a big thing at the time because it created a big religious reaction and, and, and they, they closed the place after. But there was this kind of new new lifestyle and essentially. Bashar and, and uh, Asma tried to kind of capture that image, essentially, of a new, uh, more capitalist, kind of uh, Western-friendly, at least, an image uh, lead. And, and, and that were tried to build that kind of image of being the face of this new economic economic phase. Um, at the same time, if you look at, at a lot of the agricultural area, especially if you look at um, the diesel, the subsidies, so cutting subsidies had a huge impact. You had the drought too, which you probably heard of at that point, led to, at the same time, the double sort of hit of a drought and government subsidies led to a massive decline in the Northeast, a huge number of people leaving those areas because there was complete collapse in the agriculture sector. So you had this kind of story of urban boom versus rural decline happening uh, with the politics or the political economy not really uh, justifying or, or not only just uh, mediating that process, right? So there's no way for political institutions to sort of, sort of challenge these, these dynamics. And I like this quote it's from a, from a uh, WikiLeaks document from a meeting between U.S. Embassy in 2008 with the U United uh, uh, Food Association uh, Organization in Damascus. So basically it's saying uh, he briefed the embassy of what he called the perfect storm, a confluence of drought conditions with other economic and social pressures that he believes uh, could undermine stability in Syria. What the UN is trying to combat through this appeal is the potential for social destruction that would accompany erosion of the agricultural industry in rural Syria. This social destruction would lead to political instability, he has told us. Another factor at play is the rising cost of diesel fuel in Syria as the Syrian government continues to reduce subsidies. This translates into rising production costs, providing an additional disincentive for small farmers to maintain their holdings. So, so that, was, that was kind of because it kind of captured this, these dynamics in 2008, but a lot of people were kind of seeing these divergent divergence between what was economically happening in the rural and the urban areas, especially in terms of agriculture. And again, to reflect back on on the previous period where the kind of agriculture stability was the source of political stability for the regime, you had this com complete shift in areas that benefited and areas that kind of lost out from 30, 40 years of the same, essentially what, what we see as the same sort of regime. Um, so, so, so um, again, I'm not sure if I should read this. How are we doing time-wise? Uh, um, we can. <clears throat> That's it. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm. Yeah. So I'm gonna skip this, which is basically a newspaper article, kind of, kind of again illustrating some of these points. I'll talk a bit about the role of political institutions in this. No. So, so that was that was a big question I had, even in the paper with politics and society with the reviewers. We had this big debate around this because initially I made this argument that the fact that this led to collapse of the state's conflict situation is not because we see these dynamics, but because 
the complete absence of any political institutions to mediate these processes. So we've seen similar economic shifts elsewhere, but, but usually if you lose out of these economic shifts, you have ways to mobilize, you have ways to challenge the, 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 you know, the policies or the economic policies that are taking place. And usually things like political parties or unions or other civil society organizations are the avenues through which you could try and do that. Uh, my argument there is that with the complete, the fact that you had almost none of these institutions functioning in the country was a big factor that, that rather than leading or driving a political ch conflict or political challenge to these policies in the country, that ended up in a complete collapse of, of state institutions rather than... Uh, at the time, the reviewers disagreed with this point, said, well, we have a lot of evidence that a lot of countries' similar policies led to collapse of states or to civil conflict or other factors. So we're not sure having some sort of political institutions would necessarily mediate or limit the impact of these of these process. But I think it's it's important to note that all these shifts you had at the same time zero political reforms essentially in the country. The state remained extremely top down. Um, the government formation, the local elections, the trade union, you know, all the movements, the civil society were completely controlled from higher up. Uh, nobody knew, for instance, you know, how is a new government is formed, when it's formed, how, who decides what's the government is, just like all completely presidential decisions. Uh, there is no shift in that, and I think I still think there is a story around the role of political institutions in, in limiting the, the social economic impacts. But that's, I leave that to kind of, if, 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 if there are any questions, because the two, the final thing I'll make is, 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 is if you look at 2011 map and you compare it to this economic social map that emerged in that period, there's a clear match between them. So a lot of the early protest movement that we've seen happened to be in, in the areas that were hit hard in, in, in these economic shifts, whether rural areas or whether semi-urban uh, areas on the outskirts of cities and um, a lot of these places traditionally were even seen as if you look at the 70s as bath areas you know like areas that the party had strong influence in and and, and if you look at class politics you would see almost the reverse of who kind of supported the government after and who opposed the government after that period from from previous previous period but i leave that to discussion since we're out of time yeah okay right on time okay thank you very much okay. Dr. Shell, thank you for an impressive overview of what is um, basically the post-independence history of Syrian political economy. Um, I have a few questions just to give the listeners a bit of time to organize their thoughts. Um, you can answer them in only any order you deem um, um, appropriate. Yeah. Um, so you focused on the economic policies and economic indicators and measurements that mm -hmm. reflect economic development or the lack of, and I just want to steer the discussion towards their impact and I'm interested in the social in social formations, um, the the spatial unraveling, the spatial manifestation of these economic policies. Mm. Um, I asked the question because it seems to me that there's a great deal of overlap between um, ethno-religious sectarian demographics and the social unraveling of mm. these economic policies, mm. which which provide basically the more the most robust argument against narratives of sectarianism, mm. reductionist narratives of sectarianism, explaining the conflict why it started, escalated, and perpetuates. Um, so just to comment, if, if possible, on the overlap between these two yep. uh, spaces. The second question is um, a question about economic vision. Um, despite having about a dozen uh, five-year plans, it seems to me that even in the early post-independence period, there was the lack of economic vision. It seems that it's more of a um, reactionary policies mm. aimed towards power consolidation rather than having some sort of a vision of how the economy should, should be yeah. and whatnot. And the issue is, of course, with the redistribution of wealth, when the wealth is not that abundant, it's always about who is marginalized, mm. um, which also sort of a answers the question about which social groups or formations were the first ones to take the streets and whatnot. Mm. Um, a, a comment on that, if, if possible, as well. Um, the, the third question is on not the war economies, but during the... The 2000s, you talked about the Syria becoming an oil importer. Mm. With that came a business elite, a business network of crony capitalists. Mm. Um, it seems that the way they benefited and um, had quite an impact on on the uprising and and how things um, 
came about. My question here is about, if possible, how do you see the, these business networks are under tre tremendous pressure at the moment mm. because of the war dynamics, because of the sanctions and so on and so forth. Um, how do you see uh, the Bashar government and its business networks, how are they resilient? How are they um, still able to sort of resist uh, where the, what are their methods and what are their sources, basically? Mm -hmm. Here you probably can touch on the role of regional actors as well. Mm. Uh, thank you. Okay, yeah, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Should I try and, and talk you, now? That, yeah? That's completely up to you. Yeah, and then we could take yes. it. Yeah. Um, I think the first point is, 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 is very important. I didn't really talk much about it, but all of these socioeconomic dimensions are at the same time mapping out especially with, with sectarian and ethno elements, right? So in the sense who is in what area and who's benefiting and who's losing out. And that I think is a factor that translates into a very emergence of ethnic or religious identity as as part of the socioeconomic dynamics too. So I think I see the two as kind of connected in that in that process. And I think that's definitely if you look at at the early protests in Syria, it was essentially a the poor Sunni areas in Syria, mm -hmm. right? That was kind of the, 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 the map of protests mostly in those areas. And you can't really separate that from a lot of these economic social shifts where these areas were lost out more. I mean, there's a lot of argument why did they lose out more. One of them was uh, the argument that in the 2000s, because of the business networks and the family networks, rural areas of non-Sunni Muslims, so especially Alawite area, for instance, were able to kind of kind of contribute more to the to, to these new economic mm -hmm. reforms, to benefit more from them. Although a lot of these areas did witness the economic decline that mm -hmm. is similar to the Sunni poor areas, mm -hmm. but maybe not to the same scale as the Northeast at least. But um, but but the argument is that maybe because of, of, of employment or because of new business networks or state employment. Um, so there was less of a shock to those areas. Mm. Uh, but I, I don't think, you know, I'm not fully, I'm not fully convinced by that at the same time, because I think the shift to, to, to the, the sectarian part of, or the shift of the early protest quickly into a, a sectarian narrative, I think was partially to counteract the, the fact that some of these other areas could feel less loyalty to defend the new mm -hmm. regime than they would otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that that which is again people would debate that, but I think uh, in my view the, the the ruling elite found the, or wanted to shift quickly into a sectarian narrative as to guarantee that these uh, non Sunni, especially Alawite areas, would not at all you know would still feel that we're not defended, right? We're going to fight this because otherwise there's less. Economically, they did they did feel disconnected in the 2000s increasingly. Especially, I think there is a cultural element too, because a lot of the second generation of the old elite, so the people who were Bashar and you know other people in the 2000s, were very disconnected from these rural areas at that point. So there was you know they were more born in their urban areas. They their accent, the, the way they behaved was much more similar to to the elite of the urban places than to these to these kind of rural areas. So there was a cultural gap that was growing at the same time too. Um, okay, so um, this, so economic vision, yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't know to what extent in other kind of countries in that period where political, st political maintaining political power is the ultimate objective of any ruler, there is a space, there is ever a case where economic vision would come ahead of political consolidation of power. You know what I mean? Like, you, I'm, I don't find it a unique sort of Syrian case that mm -hmm. that period, the all is political calculation were more important than. Mm -hmm. But there is definitely a reaction element there is that, you know, when things, we see how it goes for, you know, things, oil prices drop, we see what we do, right? So there was that element is... Um, and, and there was clearly, even from before, there's kind of a, almost a short-term survival economic system, right? Um, but the Cold War was a factor in that. So that. The Cold War did provide a guarantor of that. You know, in the worst case scenario, you still have some sort of... Uh, uh, maybe after that, that element wasn't there. Uh, the war economy element is, is, I think, is very interesting because I haven't looked... I mean, I'm following the, some, of, some of the work in that area. I haven't done research myself into it. But I think there's a redrawing... Of, of, of the sources of, of, of revenue for new these business networks that you mentioned. A lot of them are being realigned mm 
to new activities. They're making money out of them. But there's also a change in the actors within these mm -hmm. networks. So you have this kind of emergence of new, I'm not sure if the business class, more of a war economy class that is emerging out of the, a lot of it is related to these kind of, kind of um, network uh, connections with other countries, a lot of funding from, from other econ from whether trading with other <coughs> countries or whether subsidies and aids and from Iran or Russia or whatever. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the, I think the interesting thing from that perspective is, is to what extent there is an ability to reclaim a, or to build or rebuild a centralized political economy in the country. I think that's a big question mm -hmm. because the first you have this fragmentation of, of emergence of new localized sort of businesses, but even cons even if you manage to kind of, there's a question of what kind of political economy you're going to build. What, how would the state be able to, 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 uh, to fund it's, you know, all. Uh, one element to me, I feel sometimes the, the, the war itself is, is redrawing the role of the state in any future economy. So the state is kind of using the war to make sure that uh, what is expected of the state is going to be different after. You know, so are you going to, all the co spending or the commitment or whatever are being kind of phased out now when you're going to, you're going to have a very different country economically. You're going to have a much poorer country, which you already do have now. And you're going to have a very different role of the state and the economy. Um, and from that perspective, I think the, not, the war economy, not in terms of, of what different groups are making out of the war money-wise, but in terms of how the war is reshaping this, the political economy of the state for a post-war mm -hmm. country. I think that is interesting too to me, like how and a lot of policies that the government is doing now could fit in that in that story, redrawing what, what is expected at the state, the living standards in the country, what is okay, what is not, is being being mm -hmm. reshaped. So it's a much poorer country. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be really interesting too. But I think on the groups element, the war economy at a smaller scale, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's also a, a, an, an important point, Which, but there's more focus on this, I think, research-wise. There are more people looking into that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a less into the broader political economy that could emerge out of this, which I think is interesting. Uh, yeah, is that, did that answer the question? Yeah, thank that, you very yeah? much. All right. So with that, we open the floor for discussion. Hi, this is the first one to raise his hand. Uh, thanks, Shaman. It was a really great talk. As you were speaking, I was making analogies with, with Iran, the, like beginning with this division within the Ba'ath Party between those who kept asking for uh, radical socio-economic mm. policies, and what you describe, the moderate mm. wing, I will describe it the pragmatic mm. wing. Mm. Saddam Hussein was a representative of, that thought that is very important to consolidate the political control of the state, mm. rather than move on with more socio-economic uh, reformations. And he, he also, the Iraqi uh, re regime also faced the same Challenges, mm. especially by the end of the Iran-Iraq War, mm. as Saddam Hussein this, uh, discovered that there is a huge foreign debt that he has to pay, and the oil prices were declining, and he doesn't have enough to fund uh, to to keep the same distributive uh, policies that they uh, adopted in the 70s, which was one reason why he decided to invade Kuwait. Mm. So. From this comparative perspective, I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts about, is, is the shift from rentierism into another uh, model of uh, economy is even possible in, in, in those situations? Mm. Especially as the, the way you describe it. We're not talking only about a rentier political regime in Syria or in Iraq, we are, but we are talking about a, a rent rent-based regional, regional mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. So the way you describe, for example, the Gulf monies were coming to, mm -hmm. to Syria to, to, to invest then and mm -hmm. to fund some projects. So it, it seems sometimes that in the Middle East, there is no escape from this rent-based rent mm -hmm. uh, rent, rent model. So what are your thoughts uh, on this? Mm -hmm. Should I take, take more or what do you think? However you, you feel comfortable. Uh, Yusuf Ibrahim, yeah. <clears throat> uh, uh, study economic uh, policy at CU. I have, like, I have some good background about this topic mm -hmm. I'm interested in. Uh, I was expecting to, to, to uh, receive some information about the role of 
institutional dimension uh, after 2000, after the reform, transition from central planned economy to market, which make yeah. uh, a really big shock in the community, in the society, etc. Uh, another another thing, like I, uh, as we know, as a Syrian, yeah. the government and state was inseparable uh, context or uh, term. Uh, okay, when, after 2000, when the uh, the reform uh, started by uh, like establishing what we call it economic policy or market economic mm. uh, market economic, and start to make the reform, which we uh, it reflected a lot of uh, social instability after that. But what what the other side of the state, which reflects the political uh, side of of the governor in Syria, uh, was avoided. No one uh, gave uh, any trail to to start uh, some uh, somehow of adjustment of this system. So there was a big gap in these two policy. In my opinion, I guess uh, uh, the expectation of the Syrian youth or uh, community becoming increasing very sharply after 2006, 2011, before the uprising of of uh, in Syria. And the government, uh, the institution, was rigid and disabled to uh, to uh, move in parallel with this expectation. Uh, I was like expecting to see like maybe in my opinion. What, what do you think about? Uh, is it a good reason that to say that uh, economic uh, reform uh, is like a re- uh, alone without political reform was main reason for the uprising in Syria or uh, not? Mm. Because there's a big argument about the, the correlation between these mm. two concepts mm. in uh, stability mm. in the political region, especially mm. the socialist one. Thank mm. you. Okay. So I'll, t- I'll try and answer these two, I guess. So, um, so yeah, I'll start with the second. Um, yeah, in terms of institutional reform, I mean, I didn't mention it explicitly, but the shift from kind of, so in 2005, essentially, there was officially the shift from a central planned economy into a market economy, or what they call at the time a social market economy, right? Um, but it reflected a lot of these economic shifts I'm talking about. So I didn't use the, I didn't explain the actual, what, what they decided, but it's, you know, what, what they were trying to do. Um, the link between um, political reform and economic reform is, is interesting in this, because I think from this type of economic reforms, right? So what you had in this period was economic reforms that um, followed a very standard recipes of what is economic reforms. And a lot of countries before that was a complete failure, right? So a lot of these policies were adopted in the 80s in a lot of uh, developing countries. It was called structural <coughs> adjustment at the period. It was partially driven by the World Bank and the IMF following the debt crisis. And by 2005, these policies were discredited globally. People were saying this doesn't really work, right? And there's a lot of books, you know, a lot of even pop- popular kind of, you know, uh, Joe Stiglitz or other people who've written books saying these kind of standard economic policies that the 80s were kind of adopted or forced on a lot of developing countries to work. So um, the funny thing in the Syrian case is that they were following that recipe without really following any of these other debates that were taught happening at the same time. And I remember, because I was, I, f- I did economics in Damascus, and I was kind of trying to read some of the, I remember like Stiglitz, who's a famous economist now, I've read a book by him in 2004. I remember like trying to, because I used to write in, it's called Iqtisadiya, which is like a weekly. So I tried like writing some of these things, but that was kind of like something which is, the government clearly, they just followed textbook neoliberal reforms, right? So, if you're doing that kind of reforms, I guess political reform is the only way to avoid collapse of, of state institutions because that would be similar to the, ni- to, the, to the 90s in a lot of Eastern European countries where you had a lot of these policies implemented. Uh, but maybe the fact that you, at the same time you had a political shift led to these being translated into different forms of government coming through different elections, you know, which could be built on this economic decline. I guess maybe here is a bit of an example too, where you could use a lot of these economic shifts to build new movements that could appeal to people who lost out in these shifts and get to power on, on that basis. But that was only possible because you had some sort of political reforms too. So I do feel that in the Syrian case, that if they did economically, because they usually they compare that to China, 
right? The idea of economic, political reform kind of thing. But China is doing a very different economic reform. China is not doing these reforms. China is doing a very strategic, uh, targeted economic policies that are delivering specific outcomes. They're not just kind of following sort of textbook. So, 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 so the, and the fact that they're delivering economically could lead to less pressure on the political dimension. But I think in Syrian case, you either needed political reforms to happen, even gradually. So it doesn't have to be a complete transition. It could have been through you know, beginning of increasing the role of actually having a role of parliament, having local elections, or having governors being elected by citizens, or, you know, so kind of start a process to political reforms that would allow some of these tensions to be to be mediated, right? So, um, or you're going to have different type of economic reforms, so different types that would focus on reducing how much the, 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 the ruling elite is capturing from the economy and increasing taxation, for instance, trying to maintain the redistrib- like to maintain the redistribution, or to limit the negative impacts on on, on the poorer parts of the country. I'm not sure about the, the so the point about the kind of the expectations of the youth. I'm not sure. Do you mean what do you mean? You know when like uh, you know. You know, after like th- th- four decades of closed economy, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of shortage in everything. Mm-hmm. We remember that. Like, uh, after that, and suddenly we become like more open to the mm-hmm. global market. We have a lot of uh, needs we have to to meet for that. And there was like, uh, as as we see, like it's it's not uh, my idea. It's like uh, just a comment for Jamal Barut. I, mm-hmm. I guess you, yeah. you know this name. Yeah. It was like really make really strong correlation between that because uh, Syrian community you you can see a big shift in the consumption yeah, yeah, yeah. behavior yeah. after in the last like 2000 until yeah. the uprising uh-huh. in 2011 so this was like a kind of uh, uh, the same times uh, we, what we can say uh, that to be more open mm. your knowledge your expectation as a Syrian young mm. people is becoming really uh, like farther than the ability of the institution of the government to to like meet this mm. expectation we are talking also about the political uh, requirements mm-hmm. re- political and economic uh, equality claim mm. all of that was like yeah yeah re- um, in this in this side uh, this is my point yeah i think i mean there will be a discussion there to what extent the higher expectations were more in the more kind of kind of urban, educated, sort of young professionals group that was growing in that period and that economically was doing okay, a lot of them. Or to what extent it wasn't really a higher expectation versus a story of basic finding jobs or basic economic, which was more the story in in the suburb, the rural or the semi-urban area. So the story there, partially the trade liberalization, I didn't talk much about that, but they liberalized a lot of the imports. So if you go to areas around Damascus, don't go too far, that used to produce things like, you know, furniture, clothing, food products. All of these areas were being economically shocked by a lot of Chinese Turkish imports too at the time. Uh, and and that was a huge, so it wasn't really a story of expectation in those places to, ex- to actual collapse of, of an economic model that existed before. But like a lot of these places... I remember, like, areas we went sometimes in the newspaper, like Babila or Zablatani or whatever, they had previous economic on furniture or on clothing. And and that was from 2005 six. that was collapsing very rapidly. Um, so, yeah, on, 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 so I don't know much about the Iraq case to kind of compare, but it's thanks for the kind of the comparison. Um, yeah, but that second question is interesting, I think. The... To what extent it's possible to escape that in the region, especially when you have the role of remittances, the role of investments, the role of that channel, all, all of these factors. So I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, you have this kind of uh, a lot of work on this field early on in Middle East literature was kind of debated how relevant it is more recently. I do still think this kind of frontier political economy perspective is still useful, I think. A lot of people now argue that it's it lost its kind of value, but I still find it quite useful in understanding these these kind of relationships between distribution and taxation, between what kind of political stability there is. But I think the problem is to countries that are not actually rentier states, but they depend on a short-term mm-hmm. 
you know, sort of, sort of, um, I don't know what the right word is, but some sort of side benefits of, 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 of oil. So that's the Syrian case. That was Jordan too at a period. And, um, and these systems were challenged from, from because of these shifts massively. I still think the only way to deal with that in those countries is, 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 is the a politically a, a different, a non rentier political system. You know, it's very difficult, I see, to in those countries to build long term sustainable political economic institutions based on aid from the Gulf. You know what I mean? So, so, or it's always this kind of attempt to adapt, which is Jordan's did that in the past. So, they've still kind of go through these shifts of political economic changes based on. On, on a lot of these these dynamics, and I think it's an interesting case on, on how countries mediate and that's but Jordan is even more in that position. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I mean, it's an open question. I think so. It's, it's, we can talk about it later. I guess, but I don't I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah, we have five more minutes. So two brief questions. Yes. I'm not sure about brief, but yeah. So you've mentioned something about the fact that the government has. Uh, uh, removed or reduced subsidies yeah. I don't know did they remove it or like reduce subsidies um, so it depends there are different types of subsidies some yeah. of them were completely eliminated some of them were anyway then they probably also increased taxes in, at least in some industries on uh, it was less on income, so. yeah they tried to but that was less uh, yeah. success in that front yeah. okay and, and as you said this was one of the things that led to what happened in Syria now the, in Jordan, the IMF just recently said to the Jordanian government in the negotiations about a new loan that you need to be less generous about your subsidies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know in Egypt what they have done. In Saudi yeah. Arabia, they're doing the same thing. I'm just wondering, like, so these people in the political elite, maybe there's some economic elites as well, don't they see that adopting such kind of policies eventually needs some political response that they're not willing to give and eventually it leads their country though. Mm. Like, is there no way that they think about that? Because, you know, you may, okay, you kind of say this is like an economic reform that is yeah. needed to make the economy more robust or whatever, yeah. but then also there's like, as it, uh, my friend here said, that it, it, there has to be also a political kind of more kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. inclusive, yeah. you know, talk to people about it, you know, discuss it, like make them understand what's going on and they don't do that part of the equation, so... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the Middle East generally, if you look at indicators of subsidies per, per GDP, it's much. It's one of the highest in the entire world. A lot of countries have a lot of range of these kind of energy, food, etc. And economically, I mean, I mean, they're essentially part of the what we're talking about now, kind of the the, the rentier stability. Yeah, exactly. Right? But yeah, there's politics for it. Yeah. Now you're gonna change the economics, but you don't want to change the politics. So. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds a bit crazy, you know, like uh, yeah. maybe ignorant on behalf of policymakers. I don't know. That's my yeah. I mean, you, in the Syrian case, definitely one of the big shocks was the diesel price. Yeah. So diesel price was increased about four or five times overnight, and and there were reports after that that that's it. There's no because in agriculture it's, it's huge for irrigation, mm-hmm. yeah. and suddenly they were completely abandoned. Uh, Places that people were not going to grow food anymore because they can't, they just can't, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. that was it was done very quickly, you know, overnight. And again, it's a very centralized, top down. There is no way to know, you know, why. But don't, don't like I, I'm just literally don't, don't they think about it like just like for a minute maybe, especially if there are evidences as you said. Yeah. You know, these things yeah. don't necessarily yeah. work mm. just like that. You know, mm-hmm. you need to go through a process and it's mm. a bit hard. Yeah. Should we? Well, with that, please join me in thanking okay. Mr. Shamo. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.